Okay, good evening and thank you for coming to this press conference. I'm Dr. Steve Clifford, the Mayor of Paris, and I wish to issue this press release from the City of Paris, community leaders, and the medical professionals from the Paris area regarding the coronavirus infection known as COVID-19. And I'll read this statement to you, but it will be on the website. Uh, the City of Paris, Lamar County, and members of the local medical community have come together to assure the citizens of Paris and Lamar County that we are working together and are prepared to deal with any local outbreak of the novel coronavirus. As of today, there has been no confirmed cases of the virus in our community. Paris Emergency Service personnel are following special protocols designed to protect the community while still providing necessary services. We are in daily contact with state officials and receive the latest information concerning the virus. Local medical personnel at Paris Regional Medical Center, the Paris Lamar County Health District, private clinics, and other local providers are coordinating their efforts to detect, report, and address any virus cases which may arise. One of the key components in successfully fighting the virus is the community itself. Everyone should practice the following steps. Wash your hands often with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. If soap and water are not available, use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Number two, avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Number three, avoid skin-to-skin -skin contact, such as shaking hands. Number four, avoid any close contact with people who are sick. Number five, stay home when you are sick. Number six, with a tissue or your elbow, cover your cough or sneeze, throw your tissue in the trash. Number seven, clean and disinfect frequently touched surfaces and objects, including cell phones. Number eight, avoid groups of 10 people or more. Number nine, it is recommended to not visit elderly people and people with pre-existing medical conditions in person. Consider alternative methods such as Skype, FaceTime, and simple telephone. Number 10, expect to be screened when entering any medical facility. Number 11, expect new guidelines for visiting people in hospitals and in nursing homes. Number 12, consider home delivery options as opposed to in-person shopping. Number 13, be aware of new restrictions on travel as the situation changes. Number 14, if you are concerned that you may have COVID-19, contact your health care provider for instructions before coming in. If you do not have a health care provider or wish additional information, contact the Paris Lamar County Health District at 903-785-4561. And number 15, we concur with the President's Coronavirus Guidelines for America. A link to these guidelines can be found on the City of Paris website, and uh, these contain a lot of additional information that we're, I'm not going to read today. Uh, but it's definitely on the website, and it just came out a couple of hours ago. With the general public's help, we can avoid a large-scale outbreak of the virus and prevent any chance of overwhelming our local medical capabilities. In addition, we ask that the public not repeat or share unsubstantiated claims on social media. Instead, wait for official announcements and reports from the agencies involved in controlling the virus. Working together, the people of Paris and Lamar County can minimize this threat to our community <coughs> and bounce back stronger than ever before. So this is our statement that we have, we have issued in conjunction with all the people here. And um, let me see. So... The cancellation of major public events, travel restrictions, and the relative lack of solid information about COVID-19 has caused the general public to fear that a major catastrophe might be imminent. This has led to irrational fear and irrational behavior such as hoarding things like toilet paper. But all indications are that the vast majority of people infected with coronavirus will recover fully, just like people recover from the flu. In all likelihood, the major threat from this virus will be over well before the end of this year. But it's still critically important that we limit the spread of this virus in order to prevent a large spike of infections in a short period of time that could potentially overwhelm the ability of local medical facilities to treat those with the more serious form of the disease. This is why we are recommending these common sense precautions, as are most other communities all across the country. Community leaders and healthcare personnel have already been working together to prepare for an optimum response to the coronavirus. Tonight, we're meeting to discuss community-wide cooperation efforts to fine-tune our response should an outbreak occur. I'm here to reassure the citizens of Paris that we're doing everything in our power to mitigate the effect of a coronavirus outbreak in Paris and Lamar County. 
We have city staff and medical experts up here on the panel. We also have some other experts and medical staff in the audience. There's really not a difference between the panel, but I'll introduce the people up here on the panel. I'm Dr. Steve Clifford. I'm a radiologist. I'm also mayor of Paris. Mr. Gene Anderson was here, but he's still working on getting the, that ready, uh, our interim city manager. Mr. Kent Klinkerman is the Paris EMS director, will obviously be involved in this response at, uh, on, the front, on the front lines. Uh, Quincy Blunt, uh, the emergency management coordinator, uh, Lamar County is here. Uh, Mr. Bob Hundley, uh, Paris police chief, uh, is here. Uh, Mr. Steve Hyde from Paris Regional Medical Center. Uh, the CEO, uh, Dr. Singh, uh, internal medicine physician specializing in infectious disease is here. Uh, Mr. Mark Luke, uh, epidemiologist is here. Uh, we also have uh, Amanda, Dr. Amanda Green and she's here uh, representing the Lamar County um, the, the, the Health, Health, Health Department, thank you. Um, and I'm sure I left some people off, but we also have in attendance in the audience, Dr. David Salas of Salas Minor Emergency Center, Dr. Colin Marino of Quality Care ER, Dr. Cynthia Simmons of Signature Care Emergency Center, Mr. Tommy Schaller, the superintendent of Chisholm ISD, Ms. Kelly Stewart, superintendent of North Lamar ISD, Dr. Pam Anglin, president of Paris Junior College, Mr. Brandon Bell, Lamar County Judge, Ms. Gina Prestridge, director of the Lamar County Health Board, and Mr. Clayton Pilgrim, a uh, member of the Paris City Council. So uh, did I leave anybody out that's here that I, okay. Um, anyway, the way I want to proceed is, oh, I, hang on, I'm get, getting my papers messed up. I intend for the attendees and the panelists to ask questions. These questions will be answered by the panelists and also by the attendees in the audience as well, as appropriate. This entire press conference is being videotaped and a link to the video will be placed on the City of Paris website, I hear possibly as early as tomorrow morning. The text of the press release hopefully will be on the website <coughs> promptly, probably by this evening. Um, I'm gonna start by asking a few general questions uh, to give everybody a chance to give us their, uh, their uh, uh, opportunity to explain things about their department and or uh, uh, specific area that they work. After that, um, it's going to be completely open up for questions to and from everyone in this room. Uh, we're going to keep asking questions till we run out of questions to ask. At that point, I'm going to invite the press. If you have any specific questions that haven't already been answered, you're certainly going to be welcome to come up. So the people that do talk to, I will remind everyone, we're not shaking hands tonight, we're not touching that microphone, we're not touching the podium uh, for, for sanitation reasons, and moving forward, this is gonna be, gonna be what we're going to be doing. So, the first things I wanna ask are of uh, Mr. Hyde, what is PRMC doing to prevent the spread of coronavirus? Um, are they limiting visitors, monitoring people who enter the hospital, and how are they protecting healthcare workers? And I'll turn the floor over to you for as much as you want to tell us about that, sir. All right, uh, so uh, daily we're in discussions uh, with our corporate office, uh, with the Texas Hospital Association, uh, the American Hospital Association, the county, uh, uh, Lamar County Health Department and all, and, and talking about, and it's evolving as we speak. You know, every day something new is coming out. Um, so indeed, we're doing some things just just recently. We are um, uh, working about any uh, anyone who can work from home. We're going to allow them and work with them to allow them to work from home. Uh, we're we've implemented as of today uh, a new visitor policy um, that's on our website now. And and what it's going to be is we're going to limit limit visitors to one adult uh, per day for patients. Now. We will make exceptions uh, for uh, someone close to death and dying and things like that, and there will be some exceptions, but generally it's gonna be one visitor per patient uh, per day. Uh, and it's a one well visitor, I should say. Uh, for the ages 16 and up, so we're really uh, restricting uh, small children and coming to the hospital as well. In addition, uh, we will be screening all visitors uh, coming into the hospital and we will do screening of actually our own team members when they come in. So asking questions, do you have a fever today? Do you have a cough today? Things like that. Um, and we're going to be asking that of everyone coming to the hospital so we have a good sense of, of what's going on in the hospital. 
uh, in the cafeteria. We're doing things that we're no longer having an open salad bar and various things like that just to restrict, you know, what's going on in the hospital because we, we, we care for patients and we have multiple staff that are there as well. Um, we're conser conserving um, personal protective equipment, which is a very important thing right now. Um, that, that is a critical asset that we need to do that. Um, so those are the things we're doing right now at the hospital and that continues to evolve. I should also say we're in deep planning for contingency. What should happen uh, if we have a rash of, of people with, with fevers and suspected um, coronavirus and things like that. So we have contingency plans we're thinking about and talking about. Um, just in the event, uh, we have something like that going on. Um, we have plans for our own team members. If our team members are out sick, um, we're working on plans to make sure that they still get a paycheck and be, be able to, to get paid for the work they're, they would have done, um, so things like that. So we're, we're doing things we can to support our team members, to protect them from uh, uh, things coming into our environment because uh, as we all know the greatest risk here are elderly and those with with medical conditions and we are a hospital so we have a lot of people with medical conditions there and so we need to protect those patients and protect our staff uh, i would also say we're having discussions with the physicians and surgeons on our staff uh, asking them to really evaluate uh, is this an elective procedure that could be put off uh, if you're having, for example, your annual once a year colonoscopy, well, now's probably not a good time to have that. You know, that can be put off and things like that. So we, we certainly want to prioritize emergent, urgent, uh, important surgeries, um, but we're, we're asking physicians to prioritize that. And, and one of the biggest concerns we have is having adequate uh, PPE, personal protective equipment. So we want to make sure that we're conserving that for our most needy uh, patients and not uh, just for something that's elective that, that could be done uh, down the road. Um, I would say the other thing I, I'm concerned with is, is our own staff and, and daycares and schools uh, because that impacts our ability to staff the hospital. Um, so uh, that, that is a concern. The longer this goes on, um, that's a concern and something we'll have to consider from a community standpoint. What can we do from that standpoint? So, Okay, thank sir. you. We'll have a lot more questions for you as we move on to the specific questions. My next question is for the Paris EMS, for Mr. Klinkerman. Uh, how is the EMS res planning on responding to patients with possible coronavirus? What are you going to do to protect the patients and also to protect your personnel? Well, Paris EMS is um, taking the additional enhanced measures that the CDC is recommending. We are following the guidelines. The guidelines change about every day, it seems like, but we'll be evaluating and assessing patients from a distance at the start of the encounter, and we've got our PPE in varying layers. As, as The further you get into the assessment, if it gets more and more evident that we need to be taking more additional precautions, then we start putting on all the, the additional ones and of course notify the hospital if they're going to the hospital um, if they're going to a clinic then we sometimes are going to make conversation with it whether it's a radiology clinic whether that's something that needs to happen going to there whether it's a dialysis or something so we're trying to make sure we're not showing up with the patient that we're highly suspicious of and they're not aware of how much they've changed since the last time they've seen them and of course when we we want to protect anybody that's in the health healthcare field, as including ourselves, because there's a limited resource of trained people. There's also limited resources of PPE, and we're trying to use them on the patients that's most appropriate. And then, of course, we get back and um, we have to reverse the whole process and disinfect and take the whole unit out of service and try to get uh, everything cleaned and stocked back up before we get the next call. So we're, we're, we're following the guidelines that CDC and our medical director have uh, told us to follow. Okay. Uh, next is for Chief Hunley. Um, has the Paris Police Department instituted new procedures to deal with problems that might be caused by uh, coronavirus? If you call for a Paris police officer, there's a chance that you may get a phone call. Uh, what we've asked our officers to do is to kind of 
do an assessment, if they will, when we get these calls. There's, there's lots of calls that we get uh, called out on that is just going to require like an offense report or just some basic information or something like that. We've okayed our officers to uh, make a phone call to that complainant to find out if there's an actual crime scene or if there's or anything like that. Now, crime in progress, the service calls, fights in progress, those type of things, there's no choice. We're going to roll on those. Our officers have been uh, being given a lot of information on uh, when to use their protective uh, personal equipment. That's going to, PPE is going to be something you're going to hear a lot about. Uh, we're following the exact same guidelines we're asking you all to follow. Hand washing, distancing when we can, and uh, cleaning up our facilities, cleaning up front counters, that type of thing. Uh, we've also worked with uh, everybody in the department on creating contingency plans in case people are quarantined, and I'm talking about our officers or somebody in their family or anything like that. If we start losing personnel because of that, uh, we've got contingency plans to start running 12-hour shifts back to back. And so uh, I think we can go a long ways before uh, we have to ask for any outside help. If we do get into a bind, we always have the ability through emergency management to request DPS assistance, and we can do that. We've done it before, not a problem. Uh, there's already a statewide ban on visiting in jails. Uh, the sheriff and I have uh, had lots of discussions about people going into the jail, and of course our own, the jail, or small detention facility, we have at the PD. So we're working on all of our contingency plans. We have the officers as safe as I think we can get them. And uh, that's about what we got so far, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is gonna be for the uh, outpatient ERs and minor emergencies. And I'll let y'all one at a time come up to the podium and answer this question. We'll start with Dr. Uh, Cynthia Simmons of Signature Care Emergency Center. Uh, the question is how, are, how is your clinic uh, handling patients with possible infection and what do you do when you have a patient that needs hospitalization or that might have the coronavirus explain to us what your policies are sure well happy to um, currently we're already screening at our front door if you, in fact if you drive by our facility today you'll notice that there's a table out front and that table is designed to for us to ask you a couple of questions and screen you before you even come into our facility. Um, do you have a fever? Do you have a cough? Are you short of breath? Have you had any recent travel? Of course, as we move along in this, the travel history will may become less and less important, and we're aware of that. Um, so we're screening people from the front door to protect our staff and protect our own infrastructure. Our staff has been receiving training for several weeks now on PPE, on taking care of a patient. We have designated rooms. We have two designated rooms where we can put patients that we suspect might have coronavirus. And we're in process now of receiving uh, testing through Quest uh, laboratories for testing potential patients. We don't have that capability at this time, but we hope to have that soon, depending upon the testing supplies. I want to be clear that we are not testing, nor is anybody testing people that are asymptomatic. The CDC requires that people have symptoms and illness to be tested for coronavirus, and I think that's important for people to understand. Okay. All right, thank you. And uh, again, as, as, as it goes on, anyone will be willing, uh, will be welcome to answer any of the questions we have. Dr. Dr. Colin Marino of Quality Care ER, if you would step up and, and uh, again, please don't touch the microphone or the podium and uh, explain to us the procedures you have and what, what things you're doing to protect your, your people as well as the people of, of, of this, this area. Right. We're doing much of the same things that um, she just talked about, um, including asking people to, when they come in, if they have an illness, to wear a mask, also to wash their hands immediately when they come into the room. Uh, but the same kind of things, the personal protective gear that we're using, um, we try to, um, get the, the health department involved when we have a case that we think uh, that we think might have COVID um, and then also tr transferring the patient. There's a lot of um, a lot of process that goes behind that, but we're following exactly what the recommendations are. So very similar. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks. Dr. Salas, uh, to answer the same question, what are you doing at your clinic and uh, um, explain uh, how you're helping to protect your employees as well as the people of Paris. So we're doing much the same things. We're screening, we're screening the patients as they come to the door. 
Uh, we ask if they've had any fever, if they've been in contact with anybody with COVID or been from outside the country. Actually, we're even asking now if they've been out, outside the county, uh, since it is just a few counties away um, uh, currently. So um, uh, we're, our personnel are wearing N95 masks. Uh, we have all the patients um, uh, cleanse their hands with hand sanitizer uh, when they get to the door. Um, and all of our providers and nursing staff are wearing N95 protective masks and, uh, and uh, we're also wearing gloves at this point in time as well. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, the next question will be for the administrators of the schools who are here. Uh, check my notes here. We've got... Um, We'll start off with Dr. Pam Anglin uh, at PJC. If you would come up and uh, tell us how uh, what's going on at PJC right now, and in particular things about the dormitories and what your concerns are and what your what your plans are as you know at this point. Okay. We um, extended spring break an additional week, but we have our employees at work today. We're working this week to get everything online. Uh, our faculty are real close to having all of our face-to-face -face classes online. And we're working on getting our student services, support services, where we can do those virtually. And our plan is to have people working at home and we'll just have a very skeleton staff, no more than one person that in any office that comes in the next several, several weeks. So we're gonna keep everything going. I had hoped to not have any students in the residence halls. Uh, we sent, we have 15, we sent seven home today. We're gonna be left with eight students in our residence halls. We're no longer serving meals uh, through the cafeteria, so we'll have to find ways to get those students fed. But that is, that's our plan moving forward and uh, we'll stay that way as long as we need to and just work remotely. Okay. And also I believe we have Ms. Kelly Stewart from North Lamar. If you'll come up and let us know what North Lamar is doing and what their plans are and again, everything you, you want to say about what you're doing out there. Okay. First of all, I would like to say that all four of the local superintendents are working closely together when we are uh, making decisions that impact our kids. Uh, tomorrow at one o'clock, um, the four of us will meet and we will decide um, whether or not we are going to extend our spring break even further. Um, currently, as of today, UIL contests were suspended through March 29th, and that includes rehearsals, practices, and workouts. All of our districts have set up a time to feed our kids, and all this information can be located on each school district's website or on our Facebook pages. Today at Northmore ISD, our administrative team worked together to set up a, an online platform for our kids. We also have to stop and think about our kids in our district that do not have internet access. So we will have, in the, in the case, um, if we were to have to extend uh, past this Friday, our um, parents and students will be receiving information for online learning and for the students who do not have online learning, we will be putting together resource packets of information for our parents to come and pick up um, on Tuesdays and bring back on the following Tuesday, depending on how long we are closed. Okay. And Mr. Tommy Shalair, is he, was he? Um, yes. Come on up and tell us uh, what uh, Chisholm is doing and let us know. All right, we, along uh, with the other four school districts, we all met last Wednesday uh, with Ms. Madewell, went ahead and made our press release uh, last week. Plan to meet uh, again a week out, which would be Wednesday, but we've decided to go ahead and bump that up to tomorrow to uh, go over any other new information that TEA has uh, presented us, like, for instance, uh, closing uh, all outside the school day activities, which is going to also force us to go ahead and close our doors uh, to the public because we're real big about uh, communities, uh, kids using our facilities. Uh, well, <clears throat> as of Wednesday, that's going to that's going to change. Um, 
So we are going to be looking at possibly extending it out along with Paris, North Mar, uh, PJC, and Trinity Christian. Uh, we'll all be in the. We'll all be invited to attend. So. Uh, we are also setting up a feeding program tomorrow. We will have two locations, one at, one at our elementary and one at, uh, uh, I will be at the Roxton City Hall passing out. Uh, we are preparing uh, 100 lunches, uh, 50 for each location, uh, and we're going to see how that, uh, hopefully that's going to be received uh, pretty good from our student population. So I think all the schools are basically kind of doing the same thing. So that's all I have. Appreciate it. <clears throat> and finally, uh, the Mark County Health Department, what is their role and how, what all are you doing? Tell us everything about what you're doing and uh, what resources you offer. Okay. Um, in response to the COVID-19 crisis, the Lamar County Public Health District is working within the Department of State Health Services and Center for mm -hmm. Disease Control and Prevention Guidelines. Um, basically, we're interfacing with uh, health care providers here in Lamar County. Whenever we have a suspect case that may be presenting with COVID-19 symptoms, we're requesting that the patient either contact us directly or contact their provider before, before going in the front door. So that way we can screen them beforehand without having any risk of transmission by person-to-person -person contact. Um, by doing so, we're using state-approved criteria that, as you've heard before, is changing on a rapid basis. Um, so a large part of my job is staying on top of that and making sure that we're working with the state guidelines. And in order to, um, basically we're, we're trying to make sure that our state labs aren't being overtaxed with testing for COVID. So that criteria is changing as the laboratory capacity to test for COVID uh, changes. So we're, we're, we're constantly in flux as to whether or not we're, we're testing based on that criteria. And that's, that's primarily what we're doing in response to the COVID. Okay. Dr. Green, you have anything you want to add to it? Or? No, I just agree with it. We've been trying to make sure that everybody remains calm. We have not had a case yet in Lamar County. We are, I think we will test, probably talk more about testing in a little bit. I think people are frustrated by the lack of testing that is perceived. We're not testing asymptomatic patients. Um, again, what the criteria are changing all the time, but you must have symptoms. Um, having been in contact with somebody or very severe symptoms are the main other criteria. Fever and cough are the main things we're looking for. We're about to hit allergy season. So we're gonna have a lot of coughs. Those are probably gonna be wet coughs, a lot of runny noses. That is typically not COVID. So that's where calling your provider before presenting to the office is important and letting them know what your symptoms are and hopefully your physician um, or APP provider will be able to guide you. Um, and again, if they can call the health department, all testing is being guided through the health department at this time. So um, please. Please don't get frustrated with your physician or your APP provider if um, they say that we have to screen them and, and it turns out that they don't need to be tested. Not only is the testing very limited both from the federal government and at the state level, um, what um, the previous physician mentioned about the Quest resources that have been promised, they have not come out yet with any commercial alternatives yet. We're still waiting on that to be able to test more people and uh, be able to get a handle on how prevalent is it actually in our community. But right now we just, you have to really be exhibiting appropriate symptoms to be able to be tested. Um, so that's the main thing is that you can't walk in somewhere and just request it. And I'm sorry about that right now. Um, it's just, you have to really be exhibiting the right symptoms and it's best just to stay away from crowded waiting rooms at this point. Please stay home. The tre treatment right now, even if you're positive coronavirus, if you're not that sick, you're gonna stay home and self quarantine. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to be presenting to clinics. Um, even the testing supplies are very limited. It's a very specific swab that we use. They've changed having to use a nose and a oral swab just recently to just a nasal swab. So that gave us double what we thought we had at the hospital. We still only have enough tests to swab about 90 people um, at this point. We can't even get the swabs, much less the media that we need to transmit it in, which is what's been slowed coming from the federal government. So it's very limited what we can do for testing, and we're hoping in the next few days that will improve. But please don't be frustrated, and for most of us, it's not make or break anything. It's stay home if you're not that sick. If you're sick and short of breath, call your doctor. If you're very short of breath, call EMS or come to the hospital because it does go rapidly once you get to a very short of breath mm -hmm. situation.
Could you elaborate on how many tests we've been able to do? Maybe, Mr. Hyde, uh, how many tests, has, given the limited availability, how many tests have actually been done in the Paris area? Yeah, so we've actually sent off one test uh, so far, um, and we're still uh, waiting on that, so nothing confirmed on that yet. It, it does take a little while currently for these testings to be done. As Dr. Green said, we hope pretty soon we're going to get to more what they call high high rapid or high volume type testing and it'll be established that you can just walk up and get one but right now we're conserving the test for those uh, that CDC says you know shows the symptoms and or healthcare workers because we're we're exposed to it so much more uh, and first responders and things like that so uh, that's kind of where we are so you know knock on wood it hasn't hit us so far yet uh, based on the testing but it is around us and there's there's hot spots through the country. Okay, and I've, I've asked all the questions up to this point, and I'm going to back off. Uh, anybody on the panel have a question? Anybody who's in the audience have a question? We're going to let the press ask after all these questions. But I'm open at ev any type of, and i got several more I can ask, but I'm waiting to let somebody else ask them. So anybody have a question they want to ask anybody else in this room, now's the time to do it. Y'all going to make me give my questions? I guess so. Okay. Um, you, you alluded to it, but uh, I, I think if a person believes he might have coronavirus, this is really, really important. Specifically, say exactly what the people should do in order, what they should do, how bad they should be, what, what are the symptoms they should have, and perhaps what are the symptoms they should have in order to be concerned, when should the concern reach the point that they would take the next step? And what are, the, what are those steps? This is what I think people want to know because they're at home and they sneeze or something. They're panicked and they don't know what to do. So let's enumerate this specifically for the people. Well, so many of us, and Dr. Singh, you chime in whenever, so many of us are seeing the tip of the iceberg, and that's we only know the ones that have been diagnosed. And unfortunately, with the testing being limited, what's under the water? How big is this iceberg of people that are walking around asymptomatic, um, shedding virus and not knowing it, or having a very brief symptom? Sometimes it's just 12 hours of a very mild fever. For most of us, so they're giving a 1% to 3% mortality rate of the people that have been tested. There's all of us under here, so we just don't know how dangerous this disease really is. So if you... But so please don't be afraid. If you get a fever, if you get a cough, it is fine to, to stay home. Again, you can call your medical provider and just see if there's any new information or call the health department if you don't have a medical provider and see if there's any other testing that should be done. But if you don't get tested, you will most likely overall going to recover and be fine. So if I got sick with well, I'm different because I have to take care of other people. But if I didn't have to be a doctor and see a bunch of other people and spread my virus shedding everywhere I would probably if I had a cough and a fever I would just stay home and not feel like I had to be tested and I would know I would get better just like a regular cold very quickly for most of us that are healthy and relatively young I think that's all I would do would what would you do if you yeah. that's a very good point to not be panic it's a simple like a flu like symptoms we get so the question to Mr. Mayor is what symptoms symptom is exactly mimic the flu or allergy so you have a fever you have shortness of breath you may get some uh, joint pain or some people get GI upset. These are the simple symptoms of the flu. So it's very hard to differentiate. As mentioning Dr. Green that you have to be calm, yes, if I get the symptom, I need to be tested, absolutely, because I don't want to pass on to all my patients that I'm taking care of elderly patients. That's the bottom line in this community, that anybody who involved in the senior citizen care or nursing home patient, we have to take it very, very seriously, because these are the patients, they can even die. So, Dr. Singh, can you just add, at what point should a citizen say, okay, uh, at what point should they pursue other health care or potentially so, come to the hospital? So, so it's a very good point. So if somebody has a persistent fever and they're having the one, one symptom is called shortness of breath. If somebody young, like I'm talking uh, as somebody 40 year old, no symptoms, having shortness of breath, can't walk due to the fever, then they suspect that that uh, virus possibly causing pneumonia, that patient needs to go to the ER or call their primary care doctor. So the shortness of breath is the main yeah, differentiating main different symptom that might mean you could get very sick from it. There's a few people that are younger that we've all read about that have gotten sick. So if you're short of breath and have fever, it's probably worth coming in and getting checked out. You know, it's, 
it's hard for us at the hospital now and I think in the community because for a long time it was did you travel to China and then it's did you travel to China or Europe and now it's are you alive on the planet you know I mean every it's everywhere so it's hard to differentiate based on where you've been but that's the main thing is whether it's going to be serious or not because it's mostly re if it's serious it's respiratory serious so right. it's shortness of breath yes come on up to the podium uh, just, uh, if you can reiterate the fact that a lot of experts are saying that if it's rapidly progressing it seems to be a problem yes the faster you're getting Dr. Marino, just if you're that, sicker, faster. The video won't work. pick you up. The, your voice, and uh, yeah, re re repeat the question, please. So Dr. Marino just pointed out to please reinforce the more rapid you are getting sick, the worse off it likely is. And for the elderly, they a lot of them passed away within hours of symptoms. The faster it was, the worse it was. Okay. All right. Well, um, this is something I think is important, not, not for educating the public, but I think there may be some physicians who don't quite know what they should do. Um, and we've had some really good discussions from the, from the outpatient ERs and, and Dr. Salas. And I, would, would you like to go over what anybody would like to tell the physicians what you believe would be the best practice for them to, to, to uh, control entry to their offices? Right now, we're asking, again, that patients please call before you go to your doctor's office if you have concerns. Um, that way, they either can be anticipating you if they want you to come in and be tested so that they know that they can isolate you from the other patients um, or tell you to stay home. Um, that is a valid thing to do at this point with resources we have. Um, if, if your doctor will direct you and they may say, you know, Mark has been a traveling man and going around and helping screen and really get information and helping facilitate testing in cases where they need to be tested. Do you want to say anything more about what you've been doing in the clinics for the providers that have called you? So really the point that I would like to emphasize is if you have symptoms of a respiratory illness, if in the majority of the population we're seeing mild to moderate symptoms, the true cause of concern is when you see, a, again, the rapid progression of severity of those symptoms. That's when you really need to contact either the local health department or your uh, primary care provider. And we can talk to you and we can, we can screen your symptoms and decide whether or not you're, you, you qualify for testing. And if you do, we would like to approach that in the safest way possible so that way we minimize the risk to our health care workers to our other patients that might be in the lobby. We, we don't want to expose them to potential modes of transmission. So if you, if you contact us first, we can help guide you and direct you and determine whether or not you qualify for testing, and if so, how we can do it in the safest manner possible. And it seems like the community has already been doing a great job of not going to the emergency room when they've had mild um, cold symptoms. It seems like we've really had a decrease of that in our emergency room lately. So please continue to do that. Please, if you've got mild symptoms, don't come to the emergency room. Um, if you don't have a provider, please call the health department. But um, please leave the emergency room resources for those people who are short of breath, rapidly getting more ill, because that's where we'll really need the resources and have our providers um, help care for patients in that situation. And if, if I could say just one other thing to talk about the testing. So the, the citizens need to know you can't come to the hospital and necessarily get a test. It, uh, so, so the best thing to do is talk to Mark, uh, the county health department, because they can release those tests. Uh, the people just shouldn't show up at the hospital and think they're going to get a test. That's not how it's working. They're better to self-quarantine at home and talk to their provider over the phone and let them triage should they come in or should they not. Adding one more point of this, even you come to the hospital, the way the system works, if I'm seeing a patient, I have to contact Mark as well. So they have to go through the guideline of CDC to meet the criteria. So we have to give this information to the community, like coming to the hospital and expecting that everybody will test for COVID-19. That's not the way we are practicing right now. And we're not just deciding with our local health department. He's in constant conversation with the, our regional um, support and um, authority and Tyler and they're the ones who are helping set these as well okay you brought up self-quarantining and I'll ask the question uh, when should someone self-quarantine should you do that with on the advice of your doctor or should you do it on your own and if you decide to do it how do you do it explain that to us please do you want to talk about it or? okay I guess it's me um, <laughs> okay so 
the issue with COVID-19 is we do not have a vaccine and we don't have an FDA approved treatment. So we are recommending self-quarantine for any suspect cases. Um, at this moment, we're calling those uh, persons under monitoring. Um, if you believe you have COVID-19, that includes fever, shortness of breath, other respiratory symptoms of a greater severity than you would expect with, say, a cold. Um, we're also looking at whether or not you've had contact with an acute case of COVID-19, whether or not you've traveled to a geographically affected region, whether or not you have any chronic conditions that may exacerbate those symptoms, or if those symptoms have such a severity that you need immediate medical treatment or hospitalization with no other exposures. Those are the basic criteria and guidelines that I go, uh, that I'll, I'll judge whether or not someone should either self-quarantine, whether or not they qualify for testing. And again, that comes directly from, it, it trickles down from the CDC to the state, down to the regional level, down to our local level. Mm -hmm. um, and we're really doing that to make sure that we're not taxing our resources. Um, uh, the, the importance of self-quarantining is you, in my line of work, uh, I, I deal with a lot of, I, I speak with a lot of physicians and healthcare practitioners, and our main concern right now is having multiple people that may be infectious going into the lobby uh, in their waiting room, and if they are infectious with the disease, we don't want to be getting all those other patients that are sick sicker and we certainly don't want to be exposing the nurses and doctors to a potentially infectious disease so we're asking that you self-quarantine if you're experiencing these symptoms and depending on the severity of those symptoms we really we'd like you to call in so that way we can we can help guide you whether or not you need to get tested and um and what a quarantine we, looks like do you want to say yeah. what you're oh. recommending people do in their homes oh okay um so Right now, we're recommending a 14-day self-quarantine. So, say for instance, we we have um, a minor, someone you know under 18. Let's say that they have a potential exposure, and we agree that they need to self-quarantine. What we would do is ask for that that child to um, sequester themselves in their room, and if possible, uh, if the family members could use any sort of personal protective equipment, uh, minimize any contact whatsoever, minimize uh, any airborne contact as well. Um, if possible, you know, if, if you're giving them, you know, breakfast, lunch, or supper, I would suggest leave it at their door, let them open it, let them take it. And then if handling, you know, when, when you want to go wash the dishes, I would suggest using gloves. Just anything you can to minimize any contact with the germs. What um, about clothing? What about the clothing that, that, that how would you handle oh, the clothing? Oh, oh, to, um, Sorry, I don't have any children. So, <laughs> um, so in that case, I would probably use a plastic trash bag and use that in the liner of the laundry hamper. That way you can close it up, do it tight. And then what I would do is immediately dump that into the dryer on high heat and do that for, I'd say, what, at least 30 minutes to an hour to try to neutralize. Yeah, it's very safe, safe to use. They kill it within a minute. Oh, OK, OK. Um, I'm not. Well, regular soap is very effective. Soap, yeah. So very you effective, can do yeah. the laundry, yeah. regular okay. towels, and everything but, can be done regularly. Yeah, yeah but I, I would just yeah. try to minimize yeah. contact with any fibrous material that very may true. have. Very that true. way, if you if you have the plastic bag, then you're you're not touching the fibers where all those little viruses can hide. So mm -hmm. that's what I would suggest. For and laundry. then they also recommend to check like a twice a temperature. Day and evening time, whatever time. Oh, yes, yeah. excuse me. I'm sorry. So, so if you are under self quarantine, if you contact me, I will start a person under a monitoring form. Um, under in that circumstance, uh, we're requesting that you take your temperature once in the morning and then ideally 10 to 12 hours later in the evening, take your temperature again. Um, you, would, you would write down any symptoms that you have of a respiratory illness, so cough you know, coughing, shortness of breath, fever, anything like that. Uh, and then it, you would want to report that to me at the end of the day so I can log both the temperatures and whether or not you've experienced a uh, change in symptoms. And then on top of that, if you've been taking any over-the-counter or prescribed medications. Okay. Uh, I neglected Mr. Quincy Blunt. I want you, to, I intended to ask you, uh, uh, being an emergency management coordinator, if you have anything to add about what you do and what what uh, what you'll do to, to help to help the, the people of Paris. Yeah, 
the Marquette Emergency Management, uh, the City of Reno Emergency Management, and the Paris City of Paris Emergency Management has been working close together, staying in constant contact with each other, as, low, uh, as well as the Health Department, uh, Paris EMS. We've been staying in contact with them and, and keeping up with everything, the changes coming on. Uh, we're also staying in close contact with all the state uh, officials, uh, getting their updates, their recommendations, the CDC recommendations also. So we're staying in contact, uh, coordinating all those uh, changes as quick as we can, trying to keep all agencies aware of what is going on. So that's okay. kind of what we're doing, just coordinating it up. So. All right, thank you. Um, any other questions? I've got a few more, but uh, I'm, I, don't, I hate to be hogging it. Uh, I just want to say that the test is a decent test. If it's positive, you know, they're testing for a piece of RNA or DNA. So it's, if it's there, it's there. So if it's positive, um, it's a decent test. It's just what does that mean? You have to always take in somebody's symptoms as well and whether it doesn't mean they're necessarily contagious, just having a positive test. The nice thing about having testing come online will be that all these people under quarantine, if we actually had negative tests, we might be able to clear them out sooner and not have to have people quarantine for so long. Um, given that the uh, recommendation for the size of groups to avoid has dropped from 50 to 10, uh, what's your opinion on that, or your opinion on either, either one, but what's your opinion on that? Do you believe that the people of Paris should abide by that in the foreseeable future? Yeah. So <laughs> recommendation will be 10, and I think that's a good number. Any virus we have, any f coming out from your breath, this is the way the virus moves. We know that. So the less people, less gathering, uh, less contact, including a tensile or restaurant we talk about, I think that's a good school talk about. I got some question before uh, the came. So closing all the major uh, gathering is a very, very important. It is more than testing test and more than any medication. As he says, there is no medicine exist. We do have some medication we can use, but we have to go through the CDC. That's a very different point. But prevention, we have to just focus on prevention, how we can do as a community. It's closing the school, closing even the restaurant, 10 people not touching, less visit to the nursing home, less visit to the hospital unless required. I think these kind of measures we have to take, including always we say, wash your hand. What about church services, uh, movie theaters, things like that? What's what's and by the way, the people the people in the audience too. I mean, the, the, you're invited to come up and answer these questions as well. Uh, we just didn't have enough seats up here, and so. Uh, but but is anyone? What what's your opinion? What's the opinion? So I got really upset at first when we started doing the quarantine because it didn't seem like there was any reason. But then you saw the epidemiology things that they started putting. And I'm, we've all heard flattening the curve, flattening the curve, flattening the curve. So what we're obviously trying to avoid, and you all have heard this probably ad nauseum by now on every station, but instead of having that spike where we don't have enough people to care for people, we don't have enough ventilators for the maybe 30 people in Paris that might get really, really ill. We don't want them to all get really ill at once. We want to smooth it out so that we have enough doctors and enough nurses and enough equipment to take care of them over a few months if one or two got sick a month rather than all getting sick in a week. We can't take care of everybody if they all get sick in a week. So that's what these gathering restrictions are about. It's about not spreading the virus to each other, slowing. We're all, if you're going to get sick, you're probably going to get sick, but we'd probably rather it be over a few weeks to months so we can manage it most of us will be fine but the few that are going to get very sick we as a community are trying to take care of our own that's why we're not getting together that's why we're not getting out that's why we're not spreading the virus to each other it's very we're all going to mostly be fine but for those 30 that are going to get really really sick we want to protect them and make sure they can get taken care of and that there will be resources for them that's why they're asking you not to get together even though it's really annoying and inconvenient Okay. Is there anything we need to be stockpiling? You know, toilet paper, all of this stuff. No. Uh, and and I, I, want, I want them to hear it from the professionals, okay? No, no, that, that's really something important. It, uh, you know, uh, there's plenty of supplies out there. It's just we're not able to stock, stock them on the shelves fast enough that people are taking them off the shelves. So there's plenty of stuff. So people just need to calm down and, and not be hoarding things because we, we have plenty of stuff. It gets panicky when you go to the store and there's nothing on the shelf. That's because the 10 people that came in front of you, you know, took these boatloads of things out. There's plenty of stuff. Let's let the system uh, resupply itself. There, there's no need for doing that. 
you know, when we talk uh, also about quarantine, you know, you can stay home and, and you can still communicate with people for, you know, it's not like you can't communicate, but let's use technology. Uh, let's use our phones. Let's use Skype or, or whatever, FaceTime, whatever. And, and you can still connect and, and communicate and do all those things. But this, this social distancing that we're talking about is really what the experts say is what's going to slow this down for us. So, um, so it doesn't it doesn't hurt us as a community and and spike up. So no need to hoard things. I just wanted to hear it. Okay, uh, I'm running out of questions. Uh, so yeah, come on up and talk and ask a question, please. <clears throat> I just got a text message from somebody that was listening to this and they're starting to get a little anxious about what was going on, what we were all talking about. So I just want to ask if the panel and and everybody here if we can talk a little bit about how many people are getting the virus and getting better how many people are doing well with the virus and, and you know and who's really being affected just kind of reiterate that to the community so they don't get more anxious and that what we're, what we're saying here is actually helping people if you could do that that'd be great that's a great question i'm taking this question dr Medino. so so far we know one thing before i quote any number because we don't know there is a very fluid data so far we know the covid 19 overall even we can look at our screen on john hopkins website and total number the even modality when we met about two or three weeks ago in our hospital we Communicated, it is less. the The chance of uh, dying with the COVID-19 is very less. It is projected like four times more than usual. Correct. So the I can say with confidence right now, probably 85% people will go home without any complication. Out of so left is 15%. Who are the 15%? Is the people most likely going to be? most likely going to be ever ever 50 year old correct out of them is going to be maybe three to four percent people who end up to the ventilator or needed to be hospitalized so these are the people who needs proper care including who have a dialysis congestive heart failure diabetes so these are the people who needs to be taken very seriously that's why we're talking about all the measures so there shouldn't be any panic because the rate of mortality is low. It is just, uh, we can't compare in what happened to the one town of Italy, what happened to Washington State, because that is a particular case. But in overall, our, our rate is some, somewhere, I yesterday calculated about 1.8%. Mm -hmm. So, so, so uh, that it has to go to the community that it is not, it is very transmittable, very contagious, but not that dangerous created by media. I'm sorry. Yeah, if I can add that. So the, I think what gets everyone excited is it's very contagious, okay, and there's no cure for it right now. Um, the social distancing is what we're doing. But just to add on with what Dr. Singh said, so that 2%, that's not 2% of our population. That's 2% of the people who have been tested. Okay, so, and we're talking about, you know, what you qualify to test, of the people that have been tested, only less than 2% actually, you know, succumb to the thing. And it generally is people that have, you know, older in life and, 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 and significant health comorbidities. So it, it's, it's not deadly from that standpoint. And, you know, maybe it's a bit similar to what we have normally in the flu. What, what's concerning to the public is every day we're confronted with more and more social distancing. And that's what's really disconcerting for everyone when sporting events and things like that are shut down. But if we can just take a pause and say, hey, that's just a new normal for a short period of time, we will get through this and, and it, it's, it's not cataclysmic. Uh, we can make through this and, it, and we'll do just fine. It's scary because we've never done anything like this yeah. before, but I think they're just being very proactive and really, again, trying to slow it, not because everybody is dying, but just because for the very, 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 very few that will need to be hospitalized, we need to have resources available. And that's what's scaring people because they've never seen anything like this before. Therefore, it must be catastrophic. Yeah. That's not the case. No. It's we're doing this out of out of caution to try to flatten the curve. We would like to not have all the cases at one time and and then we can take care of everybody better. So 
we have to do this, but it's not because we're all going to die from this. It's not going to happen. In fact, very, very few of us, probably more are going to die from the flu this year than are dying from this. And we don't, we don't panic about that so much. So, uh, my, you know, what my purpose for calling this, this meeting was to reassure the public that this is not something, it, it may be scary and there may be things going on that, that you've never seen. I've never seen it in my lifetime. But it's not because it's it's something horrible. It's not. It's something we're doing. We're doing this so people will be fine and uh, then get on with our lives in just a few months. So, uh, Dr. Silas, come on up. So to, to put this in uh, more context, more people have died of opioid overdoses in the last six hours than have died of COVID-19 in the last three weeks in this country. So uh, it is not a tidal wave. We have not hit the tidal wave. And hopefully if we're successful in these endeavors, we will never hit the tidal wave. Now, uh, one more point that uh, I wanna make. Uh, we've been in contact with the uh, District Health Department in Tyler. And um, this is not part of the, uh, what they're, uh, on the guidelines for testing at this point. But what they've told us at Solis Minor Emergency Center is that they want a chest X-ray, they want flu testing, and they want strep testing. So is that still the case before we can send uh, a patient uh, over for COVID-19 testing? It it's preferable. Um, we do have concrete guidelines. Again, if we can rule out a different respiratory illness, like say if they're positive for flu and we do a CT scan and they have, it, it's obvious that it's pneumonia, then we can, we can pretty much say that it's flu with pneumonia and we can rule out COVID-19 and then we can allay their fears and we don't have to use up a test that may be better suited for someone else down the line. Um, again, those criteria are just incredibly fluid um, I've, I, I've had it change on me three days later. And again, part of my job is to stay on top of that. And I'm, I never seem to have a moment off cause I, I seem to always be looking at some sort of, uh, official website because it seems like the guidelines for, um, whichever department you're in, uh, it seems like the guidelines are constantly changing. So this is, this is where, uh, the other, um, uh, freestanding ERs and uh, the minor emergencies, Healthcare Express, that kind of thing could potentially help the community. Correct, yes. All right. uh, can I answer Dr. Salas one thing? So Certainly. A very simple answer to that your question is what we have done three months b ago, I mm -hmm. will do exactly today. If somebody came, Mr. Jones in my clinic has a respiratory symptoms, I will look for the sign and symptoms of sinusitis or flu or pneumonia. Definitely you have to go through the normal algorithm which we do every day. Correct. And yeah. after that we exclude out, then we go to the COVID-19. Very good. Thank you. I, I have a question for Dr. Singh. So Dr. Singh, as, as a citizen, so if I get coronavirus, can I get it again? Or am I then immune to it? How, how uh, you are you going to be immune to it. Yes. Very, very good question. So the si simple thing, I'm going a little bit backward about 2010, 2011. We, I was here, I believe, yeah. The H1N1 was uh, quite a bit. People got infected. About 60 million people got infected with H1N1. And about we lost about 13,000 people in America. Yeah. So, the, uh, so that was a quite a bit people. But I don't think the reaction was like that whatever reason was, is a different, not like this. Like everybody feared, and that's the whole concern of coming here is, it's not feared, it is, it is going to pass away, we have to act proactive, but we can't say that no, it is nothing. No, it is there. We have to be judicious and make a solid plan to just flat it out, and we are going to be all right. Question to Mr. Hyde about is any virus you get uh, this particular strain, you're going to be immune to it. The answer is yes. Okay. Uh, the question is uh, why you don't get immune to the flu? Like why you have to take the flu? Because this is a class of the flu virus. It's called coronavirus. We know that it is a family of the coronavirus. It used to be all cattle, sheep, bat. Once in a while we get it, common cold, get away with that. But there is so many varieties of the coronavirus. So if you get this particular strain of COVID-19, you're going to be immune to it. 
but it is possible the next year there is a protein S, protein E, protein Y will oh, change. That's 20. <laughs> yep. That's very good. Uh, what's the prospects on a vaccine and what's the time frame we're thinking that it might be available? Uh, today, Dr. Fauci is, a, I, I know him, he was one of the class he took me when I was trained as infectious disease. So I'm very excited to see. He doesn't know who I am, but you know, I'm just saying that. Yeah, it is, uh, it's always good to see. So they did inject it today in a NIH. Uh, timeline, the way vaccine works, uh, because I know a little bit about vaccine, so probably more than a year, okay. at least. Okay. All right, any other questions? And if, uh, let's keep going our questions. When we're done with our questions, I'll invite the people here from the press. If they have any questions, I'll let them ask them as well. But if, let's, let's finish up our questions first. Anything else? Uh, anybody? All right, then I'll open this. I'll, okay, I'll open this up to the press. Uh, anybody, you, uh, Mary, you have any questions, or did we get them all? Uh, that was that was the intention. <laughs> okay, well, um, I'm I've got a closing statement, and I'm gonna let it, I'm gonna let everybody go. First off, I want to thank everybody for coming here, uh, and I apologize in advance. For, in for, for, for the people that I forgot or this was this was put together very quickly and with the help of city staff we, we I got a list of people that I should get and it, it I wanted to get it together even faster than I was able to get it together but of necessity unfortunately a few people were left out that probably should have been included and uh, to them I apologize but we did get a couple of them in here and I appreciate that um, but I appreciate everyone who contributed their knowledge and expertise. Paris is a wonderful community filled with knowledgeable and compassionate people who care deeply for the health and well-being of the citizens. We truly are a regional healthcare hub and our response to the coronavirus infection has been amazing. I really think it is. The people in the Paris area have already taken the difficult but necessary steps that are required to slow or stop the progression of this disease. The medical community, the educational institutions, and the staff of the City of Paris are all working together in the best interest of everyone in our community. We are all being proactive. We're not reactive. We're proactive on this. We're doing things we probably don't have to do because because we're ahead of the we're ahead of the game here, uh, c compared to many of the other uh, c communities that are that are struggling with this we're we're on top of this okay we we're doing everything in fact we're getting criticized sometimes we're doing too much but there's no such thing so we're being proactive and and working together with the help of everyone in this community we will be able to minimize the effect of the coronavirus and before long we will all return to our normal lives thank you very much god bless and good night